parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. Say beautiful. Here, my ugly baby. <laughs> Don't lie. No. no. All babies are beautiful, right? All babies are beautiful. Now, this word here is extremely important to understand why she saw this baby. How many of you look at your, at your own child? Your child has just come out of the womb, it's coming on that good, but still, that's the most beautiful child in the world, right? Right? Yeah. Absolutely. And your child grows, no matter how your child changes, your child will always be the most beautiful child in the world. Isn't that right? I can promise you, my three girls are the most beautiful girls in the world. You don't believe me, just ask, sweet, I'll tell you. <laughs> Same thing with you. You believe your children are the most beautiful children in the world. You don't believe me, just ask you, you'll tell them. We believe our kids are something special. This word means something different than just the mother looking upon Moses and says, Ooh, that's a cute baby. I gotta keep him. It means something a little different than that. And they were not afraid of the king's command. Now our story pretty much, our sermon pretty much takes place in Hebrews, but I want you to see where the story officially starts. So it starts in the book of Exodus chapter 1. And here's what's happened in the book of Exodus chapter 1. At this time, Israel's in captivity. They are in the land of Egypt. They've been there about 300 or so years, a little over 300 years. And remember when they first came into Egypt, remember Joseph had some power. But this new Pharaoh rose up and he forgot about all the things that Joseph had did. Joseph had saved the land of Egypt. And now this new Pharaoh decided that the, the Jews were getting too big for their own, their own britches, you know. And it's time to limit their population. And the only way to keep the Jews from raising up and gaining power is to keep our thumb on them. So the Pharaoh made a decree that every single male child that is born to a Hebrew must immediately be killed. Most of them were either taken by the sword, immediately after coming out of the womb, and cut in half, they were beheaded, or they were drowned in the river, the Nile River. Every single male child. They were a lady child, they but all male children had to be killed. Here's what chapter 1, verse 22 of Exodus tells us. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born to you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Can you imagine living in this day where they're killing kids for no reason other than the fact that it's okay by the government? Aren't you those days that don't happen no more that our government don't help kill innocent kids anymore. That's what happened. But here's what chapter 2 tells us, starting in verse 1. The Pharaoh has ordered that all male sons be killed that are Hebrews. And in chapter 2, we see the faith of these parents, this fireball faith. And it says, A man of the house of Levi went and took a wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And this is not the first son they had. They've had an older son. What's this older son's name? <coughs> Aaron. This is not only the second son. This is the third son, or second, third child. Also had a daughter. Guess what her name is? Miriam. It says, and they bore, a conceived and bore a son. And he Exodus tells us the exact same thing. And when she saw that he was a, say beautiful, a cute little baby, right? A beautiful child. She hid him three months. Now, many of you ladies have had children. How many can hide a three-month-old child in your house without anybody knowing? Anybody? Babies, babies do something very, very good. They love to sleep. They may have praised God for that. But sometimes they get hungry. And when they get hungry, what happens to them? They get fidgety. And they want to fight. And they start screaming and hollering. And especially those babies back in those days, even today, get a little colicky. And they just nonstop scream. But for three months, she was able to hide this baby 
in her own house. But it says in verse 3, But when she no longer could hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes of him, for him, daubed him with asphalt and pitch. Now she got an ark, dabbed and pitch. Sound familiar? What did Noah make his ark out of? Wood, daubed and pitch, right? And she took an ark bulrush for him, daubed with asphalt and pitch, Put the child in it and laid the reeds by the river, right in the river, by the reeds by the river's bank. Let's look at this fireball type of faith. What is fireball faith? Here's the biblical definition of it. It means a determined faith that will stop at nothing to achieve the desired effect. Fireball faith is when somebody says, he can't do it. Fireball faith says, yes, my God can. Fireball faith says, when somebody says, well, God may not work like that when you still say, I'm still going to pray. Fireball faith says, when things aren't going your way, I'm still going to keep on worshiping because I believe God hears the prayers of his children. Fireball faith never gives up ever on God. Let's be honest. How many people in this room today have been let down by somebody? Nobody ever raised their hands. Everybody try it again. How many folks have been let down by somebody? Now, point to the person who let you down. What are you doing? Just, just. <laughs> it's easy to lose faith in a person because people let us down, right? But God doesn't work that way. <clears throat> and that fireball faith means we simply say God is who God is. He can never let us down and put our full faith and trust. I only have five of these this morning, but they won't get too wet. Characteristics of fireball faith. You see, if you have fireball faith, this is what you look for, are the traits of it. Here's the first one. Fireball faith counts God as faithful. You know what God's name is? And why is? Yahweh. Yahweh, who said that? Nobody said that? Nobody said that? I'll oh, smile. Yahweh's his name. And here's what we're also, as many of us, we got nicknames, don't we? Anybody got any nicknames? Any cute nicknames? In my house, I'm known as Honey Bun. Oh. <laughs> don't know how that name happened, but that name happened. And when I was, was growing up, the kids were growing up, Jess one time says, Daniel and Charity says, that's not his name. His name is Honey Bun. So please call him Honey Bun. So that thing's always been sticking around forever and ever and ever. But even God's got a few nicknames. And every name defines who he is. Like this one. And this is what you got to believe God is. First is Jehovah Ezra, which means God is your helper. You believe God's your helper. Not everybody said that. You believe God is really your helper. How about Jehovah Jireh? God is your provider. No matter what you're going, not just financially, it's not about that, but God provides all your needs because you are His children and takes watch for you. God is our Jehovah Jireh. When we say we count God as faithful, we believe that God is Jehovah Jireh and that He always is providing for His children. How about Jehovah Ra? Which means God is my shepherd. You believe that? He's the one that leads us and directs us and guides us. He one prepares a way for us to go. How about Jehovah Rapha? Which means God is my healer. Believe God's your healer. Amen. That's not talking to you about spiritual help. Or not just about physical help or sickness. But also when your family is falling apart, God can still heal it, right? Or your church is falling apart, God can still heal it. On your workplace, your career is falling apart. God is still the God who can heal anything. Right? And when we say, God, I have fireball faith, we're saying, God, you have the power for all things. I want to believe that you have the power to do it all. I'm putting my faith in you to do it. That's called fireball faith. Here's secondly. Fireball faith lives by what they cannot see. Let's be honest, in this world today, we live by sight, don't we? We only believe what we can see. But true faith, the Bible says, is believing what we can't 
see. That's true faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. I want to share a story with you that happened about five months ago. This is not to pick on anybody. I don't to brag upon anybody, but to express the truth. It happened about what was going to happen last week. The question was asked me, how good do you think our VBS is going to be this year? That was the question. We had a little conversation about it, and I said, we probably, my faith said, we probably have 25 or so. But I said, I'm believing for 50. They said, 50? Can you imagine that 50 kids here what happened? And then I got news this past week, y'all. And it's in a, in a good way, in a good way. Listen to this. This past week during BBS, we went over our budget for BBS. We did. You know what I say to that? Praise God. <laughs> that we went over our budget. That means we had so many kids here today, this past week. We had to come up and aren't you glad also God has been taking care of us for the past few years and our bank account's not in the negative and we're fine. God, we're financially stable as a church and it should went over our budget. Thank God we can do that. And usually when we have one class, we can have three. Usually we have about 20 meals prepared. Wednesday night we had over what, 120 people here. Wednesday night we had to feed all those folks. And praise God, they were all here. Because guess what they got to hear? They got to hear they were loved. And that somebody out this world loves them. And remember that little story that says here, that word beautiful child? What it meant here is that when she looked down and saw that Moses, that mother, it says that she saw that Moses was beautiful. That word in the Hebrew means that she saw the child was beautiful to God. Was loved from above. And this past week, we showed the world that we saw all those people here at our church, that they are loved by God. Like we all are. And fireball faith means we live by things we can't see. I may not see 55 kids here, but God brought them. I may not see salvation take place, but a lot of seeds were planted this past week. I got to sit in on a couple classes, and guess what I got to hear? Here's my father, the funniest one, by the way. All they kept hearing is, I love Jesus, and Jesus is the way. And I can't wait to meet Jesus. And Jesus is my hero. And Jesus is my Savior. And we teach from a very young age to have faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thirdly, fireball faith is my favorite one. Fireball faith is not influenced by others. Here's this mother. And the king had said, all small children shall be turned away their boys. They killed them all. And this mother says that she looked upon her son and saw that her son was loved by God, or beautiful in God's eyes, which all people are. And she saw her, the value in her son's life. And no matter what all the people said, and all the midwives said, and all the people out in the world have said, she still chose to see what God saw and loved her child and did not kill her child, but loved him. And for three months, she did opposite what the world said to do because, one, she was a child of God. She's a Levite, right? So she was a religious person. Or she was a son of a preacher. <laughs> she was a preacher's daughter, y'all. Worst kind ever, amen? <laughs> she decided to keep this child. I've learned this over the years. If you listen to everybody's input, and everybody's negativity and everybody's sarcasm and everybody's critiques, you're going to be a very dull, miserable person. You know that? If you have to know, my whole career, my whole as a pastor, I've been told ever since I was 15 years old, I got to preach my very first sermon when I was 15. I got my very first church when I was 16. That's a young preacher. There you go. 16 years old telling somebody 8 years old what to do. That don't work, right? But I was 16 years old and I got to preach. And my first thing I got told in my very first sermon was this. You need to quiet down. This is the Baptist church. <laughs> he 
you believe that? Then you quiet down. So take your scriptures this morning. Take a look at the book of Exodus, chapter number two. And see what God wants to tell us. That's not how God called me. God called me just like I am. God wants to change me he can. But God called me to preach the way He called me to preach. Yes, I talk fast. Yes, I talk loud. But who cares as long as God's getting all the honor, honor and glory from it? And I've heard my whole town, well, preach, you'd be a whole lot better if you did this. Or if you was to wear this. Or you should dress this way. I really just dress the way God told me to. Well, I felt comfortable preaching to God. And if I listen to all the negativity, preach, you sweat too much. Yes, I do. I'll take a bath later when I get home. I'm like, Jeremy, I don't need one anymore. I'll take one when I get home. Fireball faith is not influenced by what those around you tell you. Well, preacher, that style music just ain't my style. Well, that's fine. God doesn't care what style as long as God gets glory for it, right? It's all that matters. Fireball faith is not influenced by others. You can't let anyone influence the way you love Jesus. Yes. And I, I promised myself this a long time ago. I will never allow somebody who doesn't sing on Sunday morning, who doesn't pray at the pulpit, who doesn't read their Bibles or attend Bible studies to influence my relationship with Jesus. Amen. No, 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 no. I've had people my whole entire time that tells me they will never sing a song. If they, if they was to sing the song as they're flying up to heaven in the rapture, they wouldn't even sing that song. They don't sing They'll tell you, you can't sing that in church. That's not God. Never let somebody determine your relationship with Jesus. Because guess, who, guess who's responsible at that great white throne, that throne of judgment? Guess who's responsible for their own actions? <laughs> you. And you can't say, well, Miss Connie wouldn't let me sing that song in church while they get to sing it. Because. He's going to say, Miss Connie did not matter for your salvation. Only Jesus did. You weren't singing for Miss Connie. You were singing for Him. You weren't praying for Miss Connie. You were praying for Jesus. You weren't fellowship with Miss Connie. You are fellowship with Jesus. Your relationship is not based upon Miss Connie. Sorry, Miss Connie, I love you. I mean, but it's about Jesus. i got to pick on somebody. We can't let others influence our relationship with Jesus. Fourth, fireball faith walks in peace. Can you imagine taking your child and you know your child should be already killed already, but you decide to keep your child. She keeps Moses, but she got to the point where she can no longer keep him safely. So she did the next best thing. She took her child, put the child inside of an ark, put a pitch around it. The Bible says she did not float it down the river. Did not say that. It simply says she put the child in the reeds by the river. Which means, if you know anything about rivers, put it in the reeds, it ain't going to float away, right? You know why I believe she did that one? She's going back for her. Maybe they're going to invade her house and check her, her house. Maybe the neighbor heard some crying last night and had a fear she wouldn't hit her child. We don't know the reason. But for a second there, she had to go hide her child in the reeds. Not in the river. Not floating down the river, but just hit the kid in a child in the reeds. Then watch this kind of peace. Can you imagine which mother of you can go take your child, walk down the Pea River, put your child on the edge of the river, and just walk away? Anybody? Some of y'all said, you don't know my child very good. <laughs> no, we couldn't do that. But she did. Why? She had the ultimate kind of peace because she knew that no matter what happens, God is still in charge. And here's the definition of biblical peace. Right, this one? Here's the definition. I want you all to memorize this. Very easy. Four words is the biblical definition of peace. I'm going to say it first, then I want you all to say that with me. Here it is. Biblical definition is God has got this. Ready? One, two, three. God has got this. That's biblical peace. But what happens in your life, we serve a very, 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 very awesome God. Yes. And our God's got this. Amen. And I can put my trust and my faith, and that brings peace because my God has got this. Here's the fifth one. Fireball faith acts 
in celebration. The Bible tells us that as the Moses was in the reeds, that it came time for Pharaoh's daughter to go out and to be washed. It was her Jeremy time, get washed by a bucket. And she's going out and she goes to get washed in the river and her servants walk along the riverbed. The Bible says that as she is bathing, she sees the small basket over in the reeds and asks the maidens to grab the basket. And as she opens the basket up, immediately the baby starts crying. Obviously, she was an ugly woman, amen? <laughs> as soon as she opened the lid up, Baby Moses started crying. And she had compassion upon that child. And immediately Miriam spoke up and says, Shall I call some mother to come and take care of this child that will nurse this child? Obviously, the baby's crying because he's hungry. And immediately she says, Go and fetch someone. And guess who Miriam went to go fetch? Old Jochebed, the mother, and brought the mother back. And not only did she get to take her own child back, but she got paid to raise her own child. That's pretty nice, ain't it? And she got to raise her child. I've got her hear many commentaries talk about that she raised the child just the time that he was nursed. And then she brought the little baby back and said, here you go, Pharaoh's wife. That's not what's actually taught in many cultures. Actually, it's taught that, that she kept the child until he was 12 years old and raised that child in her home. And the child became a man. He then took them back to Pharaoh's house. I'm believing that a little bit better. That she raised her child. Because if not, how would that man named Moses know anything about God in Egyptian culture? He was raised up knowing about who God was. And developed a relationship with God at a very, very young age. When he got older, he saw the cruelties taking place to whose people? It says God's people. He had a knowledge of who God is. And not only many, many babies who are one years old, two years old, have a knowledge of who God is. But obviously he knew. He didn't learn that in Egyptian culture. He learned that because of the faith of mama who raised him. And she raised her child upright. She celebrated him. And she taught him how to handle it. We run out of time. I got two more points. I'm going to hold them for next week, though. Here's the question for us How many of you have fireball faith? Yeah, we have flourishing faith. We have faith that's full, or maybe fleeting faith. Fireball faith simply says the whole definition of fireball faith is that we believe that our God can do exactly as God wants. And there's no waver. When our God says He's coming back for us, I believe that. When my God says that He died as a substitute for our sins, I believe that. He died to take my place, I believe that. If I confess Him, I'll be saved, I believe that. That's called fireball faith. And nothing can deter that. How about you just want to pray?